Whistleblowing is the topic of today's advisory committee on transparency discussion. Federal whistleblowers report law-breaking and taxpayer rip-offs, often at great personal and professional risk. Today, we'll explore whether we've struck the right balance between encouraging whistleblowing and protecting confidentiality. We'll also examine whether whistleblowers are sufficiently protected against retaliation, and we'll look at whether the internet has changed how we talk about these issues. Today's event is hosted by the Advisory Committee on Transparency, which is a project of the Sunlight Foundation that brings together an association of organizations to educate policymakers on transparency issues. You can find out more information at transparencycompass.org. I'd also like to thank Representatives Daryl Issa and Mike Quigley, the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, for making this space available to us. And I also will uh, beg your indulgence since I'm a little bit sick, uh, so hopefully I don't sound too strange today. I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. All the way at the far end of the table is Carolyn Lerner. Uh, she is the recently confirmed special counsel for the U.S. Office of Special Counsel, which represents federal whistleblowers and other victims of discrimination within the government. Next to her is Angela Canterbury, the director of public policy at the Project on Government Oversight, which is a nonpartisan watchdog that investigates government corruption, misconduct, and conflicts of interest. Next to her is Christian Sanchez, a Border Patrol agent and whistleblower within the Customs and Border Protection Agency, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. And finally, next to me is Mitha Sifri, a co-founder and editor of the Personal Democracy Forum, author of WikiLeaks in the Age of Transparency, available now on Amazon.com and probably uh, elsewhere. And he's also a senior technology advisor for the Sunlight Foundation, and he did not pay me for this endorsement. Uh, I'd like to start off um, you wouldn't mind making some opening remarks? Sure. Good morning. I want to thank the Sunlight Foundation and the other members of the Advisory Committee on Transparency for organizing this event. I also want to thank Chairman Issa and Representative Quigley, the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, for sponsoring today's discussion. This is actually my first public speaking engagement since I was confirmed and sworn in as special counsel six weeks ago. So it's especially meaningful for me to be here with you today, um, and it's terrific to see so many of you here. Though I've only been on the job a short time, I feel some urgency to reinvigorate this important agency. I'm beginning at a time when our country is in a fiscal crisis, and as Congress tries to tighten the budget, OSC's role has never been more important. The Office of Special Counsel is a small agency with a big mission. We promote government accountability, efficiency, and transparency by providing a safe channel for government employees to report waste, fraud, and abuse, or threats to public health and safety. Government workers are in the best position to uncover wrongdoing. Study after study demonstrates that insiders, employees, are the single best source for identifying costly wrongdoing and harm. One recent study in the private sector showed that outside regulators and auditors uncovered corporate fraud in only one out of six cases. It is the people inside companies who are most likely to report wrongdoing because they are the ones who know about it. And though these employees performed an important service, the same private sector study found that 80% of the whistleblowers regretted coming forward because of the negative consequences that they suffered. At the Office of Special Counsel, we know that the experience of federal employees who have reported wrongdoing is all too similar. About 80% of the people who come, with the, come to our agency with disclosures often then report retaliation as well. This is a culture that must change. Whistleblowing is crucial to making large institutions more accountable by improving transparency. And the federal government should be setting the pace. Public servants need to feel confident that they can speak out without fear of retaliation. And when they do, we must make sure that the government is held accountable for correcting any misconduct that they uncover. Creating an environment inside the government where open dialogue about problems is accepted and indeed encouraged is one of my goals as special counsel. And the Office of Special Counsel is especially able to do this given its independence. When it established the OSC, Congress understood that for the agency to be effective, it must have full freedom to act on behalf of whistleblowers, even if that upsets other agencies or the White House. 
So while I was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the Senate, I do not serve at the pleasure of either the President or the Congress. I have a fixed term of five years, and no matter how good a job I may do, and I hope it's very good, I cannot be reappointed. This unique status ensures that the Office of Special Counsel is not subject to influence or pressure when we conduct investigations or make prosecution decisions. We are able to advocate on behalf of the lowest leveled employee against the highest ranking official in an agency. OSC is also unique because unlike inspectors general, we are not tied to any one agency and with few exceptions, we have the ability to hold any government agency accountable. And Congress has mandated that we make it a priority to help whistleblowers. Although we are a small agency with a very small budget, about 5% of the budget of military bands, I might mention, our work provides enormous value to American taxpayers. It is reflected in saved lives, improved government efficiency, and significant cost savings for the federal government. For example, disclosures from the Federal Aviation Administration whistleblowers have helped to avoid costly tragedies that could result in the loss of hundreds of lives and billions of dollars. Whistleblower disclosures to OSC led to safer flights, including better maintenance of aging aircraft, the cancellation of unsafe flight patterns, and correcting safety hazards in air traffic control towers. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina cost the federal government $127 billion. But that didn't stop the Army Corps of Engineers from attempting to install an untested and potentially flawed flood protection system when a more reliable and less expensive option was available. If a whistleblower had not come forward to OSC to report these unsafe practices, the same devastation could have easily been repeated the next time a hurricane hits the Gulf. In the health area, OSC's efforts have led to better care for veterans at VA hospitals, including protecting patients in psychiatric treatment, ensuring that surgical instruments are actually sterilized, and doctors were not performing procedures for which they had no expertise. OSC's accomplishments are due to the hard work of the dedicated staff that serves the agency. However, it's no secret that prior to my arrival at the agency, it was wracked by controversy and had been without Senate-confirmed leadership for two and a half years. It is going to take time to rebuild this agency, and it will take collaboration with each of the agency's stakeholders to do so. Everyone in this room has an interest in OSC's successful enforcement of the good government laws. As we move forward, I want to hear from you about how the OSC can best serve the public interest. For the congressional staff in the room, I encourage you to work with my office and refer your constituents' disclosures or concerns about retaliation. We want to be a resource, and we want to make sure that these claims are handled quickly and well. Finally, while there is much to be done, there are some very real limits on what the Office of Special Counsel can actually do under present law. OSC is currently hampered by court interpretations of whistleblower law. These interpretations have narrowed the protections intended by Congress and they also dissuade OSC from seeking disciplinary action against wrongdoers. We look forward to working closely with many of you as Congress considers legislation to strengthen the Whistleblower Protection Act. A stronger whistleblower law will allow employees to feel safe coming forward and speaking out in the public interest. While no system of whistleblower protection will be foolproof, there is no question that in the absence of such protection, the public loses the surest source of information about waste, fraud, and abuse. The government employee with the integrity and the courage to come forward. In closing, I want to again thank the organizers of this event for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And I look forward to hearing from the other panelists and to taking your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Daniel, uh, and Semi Foundation, and the Transparency Conference, the co-chairs ISA, and Representative Quigley, 
Uh, I am the director of public policy on, at the Project on Government Oversight, also known as POGO. We also are on the advisory committee uh, for the Transparency Caucus. Um, my organization for 30 years has worked with whistleblowers, um, both in terms of uncovering wrongdoing and um, exploring solutions through our investigations, but also we work um, to improve protections for whistleblowers. Uh, we're not alone. We work in coalition. We work with dozens of uh, really dedicated, wonderful uh, nonprofit organizations. Tom Devine is in the room with GAP, the Government Accountability Project, one of our very solid partners uh, in pursuing whistleblower protections. A word about our funding at POGO. Um, I think it's important uh, to say that we take no funds from corporations, unions, uh, we take no government money, um, just uh, private donations. I think today we're going to puzzle over whistleblowing a little bit, uh, leaks, WikiLeaks, um, the New World Order, perhaps. Um, but when we're talking seriously about cutting government waste and making the government work better, we have to talk about making whistleblowing work. And um, as the country is in the middle of this debt ceiling debacle, uh, budget cuts, uh, our economy is in dire straits, we know one thing for sure, and that is that whistleblowing saves taxpayer dollars. And the best proof of this is the False Claims Act, uh, which has been a huge success. Uh, this is the law that allows uh, citizens to um, tell us and file a claim when the government is being ripped off. Uh, and before the law was changed, this was uh, you know, returning US funds in the order of you know, in the 20 millions a year. But in 1986, uh, Senators Grassley and Berman added an incentive and asked whistleblowers to bring more claims forward. And if they did, and there was a successful return of government funds, they would get a cut, um, a small percentage. And after that, every year, we've averaged about a billion dollars in return. Uh, last year, it was three billion. So um, Carolyn mentioned that studies have shown over and over again that whistleblowers are incredibly effective. A Price Waterhouse Cooper survey of some 5,000 corporations worldwide showed that whistleblowers catch more internal fraud than law enforcement, auditors, and uh, compliance officers combined. Shortly, we're going to hear from Christian, um, who uh, um, has fought to stop the waste of some taxpayer dollars, but there are countless other examples. And um, that's why partners of ours like the National Taxpayers Union um, strongly support whistleblower protections, along with more than 400 other NGOs from across the ideological spectrum. It's also why we are very dismayed that right now the proposed um, budget for fiscal year 2012 has a nonsensical proposed cut of about $2 million for the Office of Special Counsel. We think that is the, the wrong way uh, to begin to um, heal the agency and um, restore it. It's the wrong way to save taxpayer dollars. I'm convinced that every dollar that we put into the Office of Special Counsel will yield, um, uh, will multiply the taxpayer dollars that we are, can save. So I think if the President and Congress uh, are really serious about saving taxpayer dollars, they're going to invest in whistleblowers. Uh, federal whistleblowers are on the front lines. Uh, sometimes um, a federal employee is not um, planning on becoming a whistleblower at all. They're just doing their jobs. They're just honest. Uh, they come forward, and when they face retaliation is when they realize um, that maybe they're a whistleblower. Many whistleblowers are heroes, but it really is only in the movies that they get treated as such. Um, what is it like today uh, to blow the whistle? I'm sure Christian will share his experience, but for many, it, it is a nightmare. It's a living nightmare. The system is broken. It's antiquated. And the law that is designed to protect whistleblowers, the Whistleblower Protection Act, um, has been flawed. Um, it has been eroded by flawed court decisions and bad administrative um, practices. As Carolyn said, it is essential that we upgrade this law. Um, the MSPB, which uh, is uh, the place where whistleblowers go to have their claims of retaliation uh, adjudicated after they have gone to the Office of Special Counsel, has only decided in favor of two whistleblowers between the years 2000 and 2009. The Federal Circuit um, Court of Appeals, which currently has the monopoly 
on uh, court review appeals of whistleblower cases for federal employees only decided in favor of three whistleblowers out of 219 since 1994. So clearly something is wrong. You add to this the chilling effect of an administration that has engaged in more prosecutions of disclosures than any other, and the message is be quiet. And the result is more leaks. So if there were more safe channels and better protections for federal employees, there would be fewer leaks. We would have more federal employees going um, to those safe channels and warning us when there's wrongdoing. So there is some hope. <laughs> uh, there is an understanding, I think, that whistleblowers are guardians and that they are partners in crime fighting. Uh, Congress has very eagerly enfranchised private sector workers. Um, they have um, acknowledged that it's sort of a key component of any accountability plan to have some whistleblower protections. It's been more difficult to convince them to protect federal employees. Um, but the president and both the minority and the majority in Congress have voiced strong support for um, whistleblower protections. Of course, we have Carolyn. Uh, Lerner as uh, the new special counsel, which is very encouraging. She's quite uh, an advocate for um, whistleblowers. Susan Grunman as the chair of the MSPB, also very promising. And there's legislation pending um, with strong bipartisan support that's really an anti-leaks, anti-corruption, pro-whistleblower, pro-taxpayer protection measure, and that is the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. Uh, it's S743. It was reintroduced this year in the Senate by Senators Akaka. Lieberman, Collins, and Grassley. And it would close many of these loopholes that have been created by these bad court decisions. It would expand protections. For the first time, there would be uh, protections for national security intelligence workers, uh, those who were challenging security clearance revocations, which is a really popular form of uh, retaliation. It would expand protections to baggage screeners at airports and give specific protections to federal scientists. Um, it would also allow for more normal access to court. So all of the uh, private sector laws that we've passed since 2002, um, those 11 statutes all allow for jury trials. Uh, federal employees have been, who blow the whistle, have been denied uh, jury trials. The, um, the Senate bill would allow for uh, some limited access but to access to jury trials in the district court, which we think is an important thing when the administrative uh, process fails. Um, it has some improvements for the Office of Special Counsel and the MSPB. Is it everything that we've been seeking? Uh, is it all that we uh, hoped it could be? No. Uh, but it's a pretty good down payment, and it would go a long way to improve the circumstances for whistleblowers today. Now, this bill already passed unanimously in the Senate last year, and it's queued for passage again on the House side, however, in the 11th hour of the 111th Congress. There was a red herring about WikiLeaks raised uh, in association with the bill, and uh, it did pass uh, in a different version, largely thanks to the White House and partners in Congress and working hard, and partners like National Taxpayers Union, but it was sent over to the Senate on the last day of the last Congress, and one senator, or maybe two, put a hold on it and left town. So this year, uh, Chairman Issa of House Oversight and Government Reform, uh, and um, Ranking Member Cummings, as well as uh, last year's co-sponsors in the House, uh, Van Hollen and Representative Platts, uh, have all pledged to move the bill, and we've been working with their staff. Uh, so that we can have a bill with strong bipartisan support introduced shortly in the House, and we are hoping that these reforms will be at least as positive as the Senate um, bill, including access to court and expanded protections for intel and national security workers. But we are nearly into August, and meanwhile, whistleblowers are waiting, and many of them in silence, and others um, are waiting uh, without recourse for the retaliation that they have been experiencing. Some are in limbo. Taxpayers are waiting uh, for the President and Congress to deliver on uh, all this transparency and accountability. And so I urge you all um, to, to become informed about the bill. Our staffers would be happy to speak with you uh, further. And um, I, I really thank you for your interest in the topic of whistleblowing. I was looking forward to our discussion.
Thank you, Angela. Christian. Thank you for having me. Uh, I never uh, intended to be a whistleblower, but uh, I'm here as a private citizen speaking uh, not on behalf of the Border Patrol. Um, I'm just here to speak about the uh, betrayal of uh, the taxpayers and uh, the uh, amount of money that's being spent uh, and also our national security. Uh, currently, uh, a facility is being built that's approximately $8 million at, in a small station uh, in Fort Andrews, Washington. Uh, and uh, this facility used to be housed by four agents, and now we're up to 40. So uh, four agents used to do the job of what 40 are doing, and uh, it, it just uh, struck a chord on me to, to be at a station where we have nothing to do. Uh, so you have this uh, new building, they have to house it. They've got to put new agents in there, new resources, and that's where I, I've come to terms that uh, <clears throat> if I'm working eight hours, I don't need to be working eight hours doing nothing when four agents used to do that. And uh, there's uh, administratively uncontrolled overtime that is on top of the eight hours that we work that they uh, want us to work, and I just simply did not want to work that. Uh, it's just uh, a burden on the taxpayers right now, especially with the economy, with, with taxpayers, with Medicare being cut, with all the foreclosures. So I, I, I had a hard time taking the extra two hours. Um, I'm a chaplain, so that was a conflict for me. Um, so uh, because of that, uh, uh, retaliation in the workplace has increased. Uh, uh, my family's been terrorized, vehicles have been driving by, uh, the cold sack. Um, so, uh, my mail has been opened. And it's, it's been really tasking on, on my family. So, uh, to have that type of retaliatory uh, advances right in my neighborhood. And, and I've had my kid just say, uh, to my, my wife, Mom, why are they, why is he watching us? The vehicle is just driving by and, and my, my son just makes that comment and it, it just brings a, a balls in my wife and it's tasky. She brings the kids inside. So, um, just to bring it back, the taxpayers are paying us all this extra money to do nothing on this peninsula where it's a water-based uh, border. Canada is pretty far away from that and we're just driving around uh, the, the peninsula and, and because I've spoken out about this uncontrollable, uh, administrative uncontrollable overtime, they've asked, uh, they've started retaliating on me, and uh, other agents will take it. It's free money. It's, it's money. If you give it to us, we'll accept it. It's just like uh, the, the facility here. If you give them $8 million, they'll house this place. They'll just start buying resources for it. So, um, to put it in perspective, the, the AUO is, uh, uh, for 40 agents is about $3 million in salaries. And before it used to be for 240,000 uh, agents that used to house this facility. Um, supervisors, another uh, thing for taxpayers that supervisors have uh, government rides that they seldom ever go out. They seldom ever use these government rides for the intended purpose that the taxpayer has for us. And, and that's to, to use them in patrol, the border, our national security. Uh, at, you talk about what you did before you, before you transferred to this office, like the type of work you did before? Before I did this, uh, uh, we worked uh, in San Diego in a rural area near Tecate, and uh, uh, gangs and all kinds of activity would cross over in multitudes of 40 plus. So we would run up into the mountains and it would be a single uh, agent, myself or, or someone else, and uh, we would apprehend 40 agents by ourselves, surrounded at night, different hours. So that was uh, part of the job. That was something that we wouldn't blink in. in. Sure, the uh, danger is there, but up in the northern border, there's nothing to do. There, there are no gangs or, or any uh, activity doing cross-border activity. I haven't seen it, and it's rare in two years that I've been there. Uh, a lot of the agents are really just going uh, uh, stir crazy for not doing anything. They're trying to go back to where they, they knew that they had activity on the southern border near Arizona and California. Um, here we're just spinning our wheels and, and, and I've heard, uh, as a chaplain, I've heard uh, other agents say that they're getting depressed. All this indefensible spending because 
they want to man that uh, facility. So, um, uh, if you, you talk, so when you moved from the, the, where you were before, where you were busy all the time, uh, to where you are now, where you basically have nothing to do. Um, uh, you know, you were saying that they've um, uh, been mistreating you, but, you know, where they were driving by your house and things like that. Can you talk about that just a little bit more? Explain like, how, how they were mistreating you. Sure, the uh, retaliatory uh, effects have uh, started uh, um, since I stopped working my uh, administrative uncontrolled overtime. I voiced out, we don't need this money. We don't need to take this uh, at the cost of taxpayers. So uh, I've, I've been interrogated for, uh, I was interrogated for five hours for, uh, uh, for speaking up, uh, um, continuing five hours. and. Uh, Repeatedly, uh, supervisors have asked me to go see a, a get psychological treatment through our um, EAP. And uh, it's it just been things like that that have been tasking. Um, they've taken away uh, shift supervisory duties that normally a senior agent takes. Um, they, my days have been taken away. Uh, just uh, a whole bunch of retaliatory things have been written. Anything is an excuse to write me up for insubordination for asserting myself on certain positions. Uh, I seldom ever speak about anything. Uh, like sometimes our musters last, or our briefings, the morning uh, briefing is where they uh, give you a detailed assignment. Those will last up to three hours because we've got nothing to do. Nothing to do. We talk about anything and everything but, but what we're going to do because we're numbing ourselves from just spinning our wheels there. So. That's part of the, uh, some of the retaliatory things that have occurred, and uh, uh, the last one is uh, where my chaplain duties were taken away. Um, so uh, that uh, um, is just part of the uh, retaliatory uh, things that have been occurring to me as a, a, for speaking of. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk about this some more a little bit later on. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, thanks, Sunlight Foundation and uh, Representatives uh, Isa and Quigley. Uh, for setting up this advisory committee. Um, I think it's appropriate that we're uh, meeting today uh, to talk about strengthening uh, whistleblower protections, um, not only because uh, it was 233 years ago that the Continental Congress actually enacted the first whistleblower protections. Um, I don't know if you picked the state knowing that it's actually July 30th, 1778. Uh, but I, I think also uh, with the country focused on um, this debate over the debt ceiling, and which is all fundamentally about how we spend uh, taxpayer money, and you would think that if Congress uh, wanted to demonstrate more seriousness about saving the taxpayers' money, uh, that they would be adding funding to the OSC rather than trying to subtract funding from it. And similarly, they'd be adding funding for the government's e-government programs like data.gov instead of whacking those budgets as well. It's penny wise and pound foolish. Um, I don't know how many of you have got a chance to uh, read the paper today. There's a great and, and uh, appropriate story uh, in the New York Times um, about China, which I thought uh, would be worth mentioning to sort of frame my, my remarks. Um, the, the headline is, In Bearing Facts of Train Crash, Blogs Erode China Censorship. And the story uh, describes how five days ago uh, there was a terrible railway crash, killed more, more than 40 people, two trains collided. Um, and the official Chinese news uh, paid very little attention to it. Um, but meanwhile, social media in China, which is as robust or even more then here in the United States has been all over the story. Within minutes, there were people on the scene who were doing the equivalent of tweeting. Um, and according to uh, this New York Times story, there have been more than 26 million posts uh, about this railway disaster. And a lot of them have uh, had the effect of um, uh, uncovering government uh, uh, misbehavior, such as uh, railway workers literally burying the train, the head car of one of the trains in the accident, burying it on the scene uh, to prevent um, uh, 
further inquiry into maybe what the cause was, and when uh, bloggers managed to uncover this fact, they spread that news so widely that the government has been forced to dig up that train and send it out for further, invest further inspection. Um, what does this tell us about uh, the age we're entering? Well, I would argue that we are uh, into an age of mass participation. Um, and we're going to see more and more citizen watchdogging and whistleblowing take place. Uh, I think a lot of our conversation is going to be about this issue of leaks and how do we deal with leaks, how do we stop leaks, are leaks good or bad? Leaking is the wrong metaphor because it makes you think that what we're talking about here is a little drip of information that's escaping. When, in fact, the, the correct metaphor, and I'm borrowing this point from uh, Harvard professor Larry Lessig, is that we are living in an age of, of an information tsunami. Um, and the question is, or one of the questions, I think, is how uh, should government deal with that? Um, under the 20th century uh, model of government that we now have, the administrative model, uh, the hierarchy rules. Right? And either you stay within channels uh, or you're punished when you actually try to speak out, uh, as, as Christian Sanchez was just describing. Um, and absolutely, we have to strengthen the protections for people on the inside to speak out. But I think we also have to recognize that we're seeing the emergence of a whole new paradigm uh, where the boundaries between what government is and what the public is are, are, are getting blurred. In the same way that the old lines between businesses and consumers are also blurring. And so I think it's important uh, that we recognize that the, the reaction to this flood cannot be to just lash out and try and punish individuals. Um, it's sort of like the, the boy putting his finger in the dike. Um, what the United States government did in response to Bradley Manning, who at least is accused of uh, leaking all this information to WikiLeaks, was the wrong response. And by the way, I should mention that Manning has been uh, now uh, held for a year, waiting to go on trial, a year. Um, you think that the wheels of justice can move a little faster. But the response that uh, we saw after WikiLeaks started publishing uh, things like the Iraq and Afghan war logs and then the State Department cables uh, was way over the top. Not just the rhetoric about uh, trying to assassinate uh, or otherwise um, harass Julian Assange, uh, but the extra governmental actions that amounted to uh, extra legal kinds of censorship. Um, I mean, imagine if when the Pentagon Papers were being published by the New York Times, um, that the Nixon administration Justice Department would have gone after the paper suppliers and said, are you going to keep selling paper to the New York Times so we can keep publishing? Uh, but that's effectively what Senator Lieber Lieberman did uh, in going after companies like Amazon and PayPal. Um, and it's exactly the wrong response because it's the boy putting his finger in the dike. The flood is what we have to deal with. Um, and I would argue that when we suppress, when we try to suppress information in this age, we actually just make it more valuable and interesting. It's called the Streisand effect. And that's from when Barbara Streisand got upset because a geological survey of the California coastline that had been done, that was photographs of every 100 feet of coastline, and was published online, and she sued to try and get the pictures of her house uh, removed, and all that did was make people more interested in seeing pictures of her house. <laughs> so I think we're, it's important to recognize, we are swimming in a sea of social media, and this is not going, it is only going to rise, it's not going down. And inevitably, all that media is going to include more and more previously privileged information, including vital information about waste, fraud, and abuse. And so the, the question I think we should be exploring is how do we deal with the tsunami because we can't stop it? Thank you very much. Um, I think I'd like to, to
to start uh, in the context of, you know, we're, we're talking around um, some terms, uh, whistleblowing and retaliation. Um, but I think I'd like to make it more concrete. What is whistleblowing? And what are the different types of retaliation that uh, people suffer? Um, these might, this might be sort of a, a good foundational question that's being as we kick off this discussion. Is there a would you like to uh, start with that? Sure. Um, whistleblowing is sort of shorthand for when somebody you see something that's wrong and they report it. Um, in the government context, uh, there are some very kind of complicated hoops that employees have to go through to make sure that their reporting of waste, fraud, and abuse or a health and safety issue is actually um, covered by the Whistleblower Protection Act. For example, if it's within your job responsibility to uncover waste, fraud, and abuse and then you report it, you're not covered um, as, as a whistleblower. If you make a report of wrongdoing to the person who is doing the thing about which you're reporting, you're also not covered. Um, but generally, if you're a whistleblower, it means that you know about something that's wrong, waste, fraud, and abuse, a health or safety issue, and you report it. Um, and what was the second definition that you wanted to know about? And what is retaliation? Retaliation is when something bad happens uh, to you for having uh, blown the whistle or for having come out with the information, and that's in, in its very simplest term. But some examples of that are when an employee in the federal government may have his or her duties taken away. Um, for an example today about uh, someone's student, uh, Mr. Sanchez's duties as a chaplain being taken away from him, uh, being referred uh, for psychiatric evaluation, or to go see the employee assistance program. Um, often, you know, it's, more, it's even more dire where someone loses their job or is threatened with termination. Um, they can be suspended, they can be transferred to, to another place, they can be told to move to another state or another duty station. Um, really, it's any, any action that has an adverse consequence on someone's terms or conditions of work uh, would be considered retaliation in the federal government. I, I guess the sort of follow-up question is, how does the context of, of the communication affect how we think about it? So you, you can have, you, you know, you can go and tell your supervisor, you can tell someone within, within Congress, you can tell someone within the executive branch, like OSC, you can go to the press, um, you can go and put information on the internet. As people report information in, in different ways, in different media, does that change how we think about whistleblowing and its legitimacy, and should it change how we think about those kinds of things? Well, it changes the legal protections that are available to the person blowing the whistle. As Carol mentioned, there are, you know, a labyrinth of uh, rules, uh, law to navigate uh, in order to be considered protected. It's a protected disclosure. Um, uh, as she said, you know, if you refer to the person who is um, doing the wrongdoing or if you um, aren't the very first person uh, to have disclosed the wrongdoing. And this is part of the case law that has eroded congressional intent that we're trying to fix. Um, I would say we would all be better off as a society, uh, we'd have a better government if we just protected all whistleblowing, if we just, everybody got to go to court, and if we didn't put so many constraints on uh, what whistleblowing is, um, but we don't live in that world, and so what the best we can do is try to um, make it make more sense of the law and make it easier for people to come forward. Think about, you know, if you know you could be retaliated against, and I think most federal employees do. I think most federal employees have gotten the message that they're putting their jobs on the line at the very least if they come forward with something that's going to rattle. Um, their office. And think about, you know, the cost-benefit analysis that you might do uh, given those conditions. It, it, there's not a lot of benefit here. In fact, there's zero. It's all cost um, for a federal employee. The least we can do if we're not going to incentivize as we do for private citizens, we'll give you a piece of the reward that you uh, cover for us as taxpayers. If we're not going to incentivize it. We at least need to make it um, 
that make it so that uh, they can have recourse to their suffering? I guess the only thing I just want to add to that is expanding on my remarks at the beginning, which is that you can change the culture of government. And this is obviously not going to happen overnight, but it should be a valuable thing. You should view it as um, something that helps people progress in their careers if they disclose waste, fraud, or abuse, or health or safety concerns. It should be viewed in a positive way, not, not as something that should be covered up or, or the subject of disciplinary action. Um, and it shouldn't require a litigation for someone to feel that they have protections from coming forward. Um, and I think the message has to come from the very head of each agency that um, we want people to come forward and make these disclosures. It should be, um, you know, if not compensated financially, it should be rewarded in some way. So finding ways to change the culture in our government, I think, um, is a really important first step. Sure. Let me just sort of, sort of follow on that. Does it matter uh, what, how the context of that reporting? So if it's if it's done through, you know, if you try to go through official channels, for example, and, and uh, either nothing happens from going through official channels, or worse, you find that you're retaliated against, and then you go in and you talk to the press, for example. Um, should the, the concept of whistleblowing and the protections uh, that we're envisioning, should it sort of go into that? protecting that context as well? You know, um, or is that is it starting to go too far? I'll answer that very quickly. You just said that the context, you know, one of the longest standing principles of whistleblower law is that the context shouldn't matter. The forum, the form, or the context for making the protected disclosure should not matter. It's not relevant. So I, I would also like to um, add on to what Carol said about it being about leadership and changing the culture, and I have a lot of hope that you're going to be able to encourage um, some culture change uh, by working with the agencies. Um, I think that they've ignored um, whistleblowers um, in the best of cases, and worse have um, you know sought to punish them and uh, turn them you know into villains instead of heroes in um, the worst of circumstances. But we need to address the fact that we also have a president who has um, been very supportive um, in speeches and behind the scenes in terms of protecting, uh, working for stronger protections for whistleblowers. Um, even as an attorney, he represented a whistleblower, worked on case uh, for a whistleblower, and I think he really does um, um, uh, understand the value uh, of whistleblowers. Um, but I don't know that. Everybody got the memo in the administration. Um, the, the memo that they did get after WikiLeaks was shocking. So at the end of last year, um, well actually it was January 3rd when this memo came out, but they were scrambling um, between Christmas and New Year's to come out with something. Uh, OMB and ISU put together what we thought was a, a very reasonable response. Agencies, please evaluate how you are managing your information. Look at information security, the handling of classified information. Look at your employee, um, uh, your management of employees, and your reviews of employees. Okay, this all you know, this seems like a reasonable response. Until you look at the checklist that they attached um, to the memo, which said, hey, agencies, do you ask your employees if they are grumpy? Do you evaluate their pre- and post-employment visits to websites like WikiLeaks? And alarm bells go off. We sent a letter with some of our partners um, in the NGO community and said, are you really asking agencies, is this, the, is this the guidance that you are giving? Is this where the direction we are headed in with information? Because we have civil liberties concerns, we have employee rights concerns, we have whistleblower rights concerns, and uh, we think this message is is off. Um, a meeting resulted from that letter and we were told, you're right, we messed up. Wow, we really didn't intend for the agencies, first of all, to use the checklist and ensure that they are, this was just things that were in some agencies and that list that you're concerned about came from the intelligence community. Now, okay, 
Um, there are, you know, behavioral issues are legitimate in terms of uh, employee review in the intelligence community that's different from being a civilian employee. That's really, really different. They said, um, we also agree, like, there's some concerns here. And they said, we would like to put into balance, you know, the civil liberties and whistleblower protections that, that you're concerned with, with national security. And we said, great. Why don't you put that in a letter? <laughs> How about another memo? Let's do another memo, and we're still waiting for that. So and there was a similar, um, or at least a related reaction in Congress, where access to WikiLeaks was cut off, um, both for congressional staff and for uh, Library of Congress, including CRS. Uh, there was sort of a, a, a willful winding to the nature of the information that had been made available, where also, executive branch employees were, were uh, threatened with punishment if they were to either uh, during work hours or otherwise go to any of these sites. Um, and, it, and it seems that this is sort of a cutting off of, of valuable information. Uh, as more and more of this information becomes available, uh, maybe this is, this, is a, this is sort of a good, uh, broader kind of information sharing question, maybe this would be good for you. Um, does it make sense to have the government um, saying there are places that you can look for information, places that you can't look for information, the avenues that you're allowed to explore and avenues that you will be punished, whether you look there on your, on, you know, on the public side or looking at it on your own free time? Is this is this a sensible response? I mean, sort of, can guess what I might think about this, but is this sort of a sensible response? If not. Um, Assuming that there is classified information as, that's being made available through through bulk releases on WikiLeaks or elsewhere, what would an appropriate uh, governmental response be to something like this? Well, I'll take that. Uh, for starters, um, the idea that there are two to three million people with security clearances with access to quote classified information is absurd. I mean, when so many people uh, have access to secrets, they're not really secrets. Um, uh, so I think, you know, it's time to dust off a copy of, of Danny Patrick Moynihan's report uh, from 1996-97 that he did uh, uh, on this issue of overclassification. Um, and uh, the government does have secrets it needs to keep, um, and it should focus on, on those, but at the same time it should, I think, deregulate uh, a great deal of, of uh, stuff that is now just, uh, it's almost like um, uh, a system that's out of control. Um, you know, the, the, the lesson of, of Bradley Manning is when that many people have access uh, to classified information, all it takes is one person. Um, you know, the, the weakest link, if you will, um, who maybe for reasons for con of conscience, maybe, maybe uh, you know, he was having emotional problems. Whatever it is, the weakest link is is the uh, place where you have to worry about uh, a failure happening. And so the right answer, I think, is focus first on the things that are truly important to keep secret and strengthen uh, your procedures for protecting that kind of information. And at the same time, uh, the rest of government, I, I think we need to move into a uh, philosophy that Government, what government does should be public by default and, and secret only when necessary and not the opposite. Um, and this, this is the 21st century. It's going to happen either because of enlightened action on the part of government or because we, uh, the people who pay for government, will do it to government. And that will be messy and, and um, disruptive. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of how this could work. Um, in, in a less uh, charged area at, at, than um, national security. Uh, when <coughs> President Obama uh, came into office, his, one of his first priorities was uh, the spending on uh, recovery. And Congress passed a huge uh, $787 billion spending package. And one of the things that he said he would do um, to involve the public in uh, helping watch that this money was actually being well spent was create a website called recovery.gov and he made a couple of speeches where he said we will 
uh, invite you to be the eyes and ears, and you, will, you can help report whether the money that was supposed to be spent on, say, uh, you know, expanding a, a local elementary school is actually being spent properly, and it isn't just going into the pockets of, you know, the nephew of the mayor. Um, but uh, recovery.gov has never really involved the public in a new way. They have a, you know, a, a number you can call or an email address that you can send tips to. But the idea of um, engaging we the people in co-creating better, more effective government is an idea that is still waiting uh, to be implemented. And, and there was an opportunity there, I think, also to help re change how government works and help begin to restore trust in government as uh, something that can make people's lives better. When you hear stories like Christians, of uh, you know, a small agency uh, allegedly uh, just wasting money. I mean, that's fodder for people just saying, forget it, government is uh, only the problem and not the solution, and we should just get our money back. Um, so you would, have, you would think that this administration would make it more of a priority. So I don't think this is a, a partisan issue. This is this idea of in, engaging the, all of us in helping government work better is, it can be adopted by liberals and conservatives alike. Uh, um, because what I think at the end of the day people want is just smarter and more effective government, more efficient government. They don't care whether it's big or small. Um, and so to, to bring this back to uh, how we approach uh, the issue of whistleblowing, I think the, the, the philosophy needs to be we need to encourage it, we need to reward agencies for having more uh, ways for fraud and abuse being uncovered rather than less. And they need to be supported because they think right now that, that they will be punished because this is a sign of failure, right? But if we're going to fix our government, we have to accept that we're going to root out some, some failure along the way. And this is natural to the business uh, world. Um, I mean, Google's philosophy is fail quickly. And in government, you're not allowed to fail once. Uh, and that's why I think we, we still see this culture of punishing the whistleblower rather than, than giving them an award. The uh, recovery.gov uh, experience was disappointing in terms of bringing crowdsourcing of government to a new level. Uh, did have a remarkably low incidence of uh, fraud and waste and was a success on many levels in terms of more transparency and government spending than we've ever had before. And it's now become the model for a government-wide um, board um, to reduce waste and fraud and um, to create a similar website, a similar portal for government-wide financial spending. Um, the president issued an executive order a um, month ago to create that. Uh, Earl Devane, who's one of our best inspector general, inspectors general, uh, who led the Recovery Act board, uh, will be now uh, doing this new board, leading the new board. And Chairman Issa has a bill to Give, to create a similar um, uh, board and to create data standards so that we actually, the, the money that we're spending, whether it's reported by an agency or by the recipient of government funds, we'll be able to actually track it for the first time. So there is some promising, um, uh, I think, transparency policies on the horizon, but in terms of getting to the point, as you said, Nico, where the lines between government and citizen blur, I actually think that those lines are becoming harder. I think that the walls are going up. Because I think when you have um, members of Congress who have to fundraise and who are looking at unlimited spending by special interests in their elections, it means they're, they're, they're going to be representing um, naturally fewer and fewer public interests, citizen uh, interests, and uh, I think I'm seeing more and more government secrecy in the agencies. While we're pursuing more transparency, it's, it's that accountability piece of transparency. Transparency means different things to different people. Uh, to the president, it means participation and collaboration. Uh, and, and that's been great too, you know, there's, that's all good. 
but then the accountability piece might get lost behind and that's the least popular aspect of transparency unless of course you're holding someone else accountable uh, actually i had uh, just sort of one uh one question one one additional question for christian here too is um you, you saw that the bad things were happening and you tried to respond to it in can you, can you talk a little bit more about the process in which um, you tried to correct the problems that were existing and sort of push back what you were seeing? <clears throat> Initially, I wrote a, a memorandum to my uh, patrol agent in charge, or assistant patrol agent in charge, uh, describing that we were going to get 12 new agents um, and uh, that we would need a purpose, we would need a mission. And uh, that uh, supervisors were bored. I myself have been tailed by uh, one of my supervisors, and that was one of the reasons why I wrote that memorandum, is he has nothing to do. He just tailed me before the ship. So I wrote a memorandum, and I explained that if we don't have some type of mission or purpose, you're going to get this backlash with all these agents that have nothing to do. And that's what we're going to start seeing, not only for myself, but for others that are already articulated that they're depressed. Um, I walked into a, a, a meeting, it was a video conferencing, and I, I, I it was uh, between uh, other uh, specialty details, and I, I told him I didn't have to be there. It, it was a private video conference, and he said no. But the uh, premise of the video conference was uh, detailing the boredom of agents on the other side, in another uh, 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 stations, at other stations, and that this is a, a problem. So they are aware that boredom is a problem and that we're wasting taxpayer dollars when these resources could be shifted to uh, other areas where, where we do have an a, a inflow or an influx of uh, gangs, uh, illegal aliens. So um, because I voiced that out, retaliation has started and uh, it's, it's been pretty taxing on myself and my family. So uh, we're going to ask uh, for questions from the audience. Well, my question is to you, Ms. Lerner. Um, it seems to me in the uh, great high of government uh, uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, a really big slice is in the United States military. Um, my question to you is, what is your office planning on doing to uh, expand your presence into the military? And I'm not talking about acquisitions. That's bad that enough. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day operations of the military, getting stories like your own, um, and dealing with this exploding uh, cost of uh, the day-to-day the -day operations uh, in the Pentagon. It's a great question. Um, the Department of Defense obviously has a very active Office of Inspector General, and we would already hope to We've already been in touch with folks in that office and hope to work closely with them. But to the extent that our office is limited in terms of what we can investigate, we can't just go after the Department of Defense. We have to have a specific complaint. We have to have a specific disclosure. Um, so in order to do an investigation or to um, bring the attention of a problem to an agency head, we have to we have to be on the receiving end. So um, to that extent, we're, we're somewhat limited. But to the extent that we can work with uh, agency inspector generals, we will do so. And one of the things that I am uh, doing is sitting on something called the Council of Inspector Generals, where I meet very regularly with the inspector generals from each of the agencies, including the Department of Defense, to talk about these issues. So just a brief follow-up. Uh, the problem uh, from my own experience, as I was uh, in the military for five years, is that there just isn't an avenue like a recovery.gov uh, for troops at the low level to you know, uh, report uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. And you're going to the inspector general, it just, it, it, you know, those folks deal with you know, complaints about what my commander is doing, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it, the problem from, again, my own experience is, is just that there isn't a, a, a resource for these guys. Uh, to to blow the whistle. They can come to the Office of Special Counsel. No, I <laughs> yeah, I, I encourage that. Um, and I don't, you know, other than right now, other than going to the IG or coming to the Office of Special Counsel, I'm not aware of any other 
outlet. Um, but there may, you know, there may be some that I'm not aware of. Um, but I hear your concern, and it's an important one. Let me just uh, follow briefly. So, um, as as currently uh, instantiated in your office, uh, do you have the power to start investigations on your on your own, or do you have to wait until a complaint is brought to you? At least historically, the way it's worked is that uh, we can't sui sponte go after something that we read about in the paper or you know hear about. We actually have to have someone come to us and say, "I'm aware of the situation." Through our, this, is, this happens through a disclosure unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit different when someone has a claim of retaliation or a prohibited personnel practice. And the Office of Special Counsel doesn't just deal with disclosures and whistleblower complaints. I mean, we actually have a very broad mandate. We deal with complaints from members of the military uh, under the USERA, the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Uh, we deal with um, Hedge Act cases which unfortunately has taken up more and more of our time recently. Um, and we deal with all types of prohibited personnel practices, not just retaliation complaints um, after someone has blown the whistle. So things like sexual orientation discrimination, um, political affiliation, marital status, and other types of prohibited personnel practices are also within our jurisdiction. And then there's the disclosure unit, um, which is the um, unit that takes uh, the complaints from people who want to make a disclosure. So, many people are in your office? The agency has 110 full-time employees, and we have three field offices, one in Detroit, one in Oakland, one in Dallas, and we have about 4,000 complaints a year. So a lot to do with very few resources. I have two um, kind of uh, two sides of the coin question for um, Christian. One is on um, um, the waste, wasted spending. Uh, when agents aren't driving the Baja 500 and they're stuck in the office, uh, how do they spend their time if there's no casework to do? Um, the other question is about uh, the retaliation. Um, and have there been uh, any other invasions of your uh, family's privacy besides um, uh, sitting in front of the house while you're at work? or uh, opening your mail? Um, to answer the first question, uh, I've uh, witnessed supervisor uh, just play as a musical instrument the whole 10, shift, the whole 10 hours of our shift. So uh, um, that, that's pretty much one of the indications that uh, a supervisor just lets me know that there's no work to do if the supervisor is playing his instrument all day long for his honor guard. There's nothing to do. Um, and uh, another uh, agent has told me that he's seen another supervisor um, with his gun belt off uh, and his feet propped up on the desk reading a 300 page book. So um, those are two examples of, of what I've seen uh, um, where uh, our supervisory management uh, really has nothing to do. And that's what we're following is their leadership. And that's just uh, letting us know about that. And uh, on your second question, uh, um, when my wife and I go to uh, my uh, lawyer's office, uh, um, we've, we've had vehicles taking pictures of us coming on uh, the opposite traffic just out of nowhere. We're, we're, we're just seeing flashes towards our vehicle and uh, also uh, at his office when we're getting off, uh, my children will notice that someone's looking at us. And then my wife and I noticed that someone was uh, taking the pictures of us from that uh, angle from the, the building where we're about to enter. This is kind of a follow-up to the question that was asked by the person who was in the military. Um, in general, for people who are in the government, it seems like there are kind of limited forms, or at least from their standpoint, it may not be something that they would automatically do, go to the OSC or, or go to um, whatever, go to the IG hotline and make a, you know, a complaint or report something. And I'm wondering, with the discussion from people on, you know, this new age of transparency and with, with um, web access and, and other things that allow people to communicate information, uh, do you have any any ideas on uh, maybe not maybe not even government specific, but for any organization where they're looking for I would get away from the word whistleblowing, looking for disclosures or information on things that may not be right or things that just may be, um, could be done better 
if there's some uh, something on the horizon that seems promising to allow uh, employees of any organization to actually make those types of disclosures in the new era of you know web access and where people can report things and you know blog on things and is there something beside the just this, the basic requirements or the basic um, laws that surround you know whistleblowing the formal structure that seems to be promising in terms of the area of getting people comfortable to going out and making sort of um, disclosures of any type. Do you have any ideas on that? You know, I, I think um, one thing about the new age is also the degree to which it is empowering people who, who want to remain anonymous. I mean, the, we're talking about whistleblowing, which typically involves someone, you know, uh, uh, speaking up publicly, and there are all sorts of risks that come with that. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's not a new phenomenon of people making anonymous tips to whatever, you know, to news organizations or to uh, uh, police or relevant authorities. Um, uh, I think that one thing that is coming, and uh, we'll probably see uh, first signs of this later this year, is in the wake of WikiLeaks, uh, there is a, a new project called OpenLeaks, um, which is designed to sort of deal with some of the obvious problems with WikiLeaks, uh, which is to say WikiLeaks has a lot of power. It's all centralized in the hands of one individual who um, is, let's say, a bit controversial um, and who has his own agenda about what information should be used for, uh, whereas OpenLeaks is being built by programmers who used to work with WikiLeaks. And their goal is to make it easy for lots of organizations to receive information anonymously, to verify its uh, validity, and to make it available to responsible uh, media. Um, and so uh, once that happens, I think we will see a sort of digital version of, of uh, uh, more whistleblowing taking place by insiders who don't want to risk retaliation. I mean, I think, you know, this, Angela, you said something interesting uh, in your opening remarks about, uh, if, I, if I heard you correctly, if we don't strengthen the laws to sort of channel uh, whistleblowing appropriate, appropriately through government, then we're going to see more leaking. Um, and I, I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about that. I think that's right. I do think we're going to see more, and again, it ain't just leaking now, it's a flood. Uh, and it's going to grow as more people realize um, that the benefits can outweigh the costs. Well, and I also agree with your point about the overclassification being a huge contributor to the problem, and that we should only be keeping secret our legitimate uh, class information that legitimately should be classified. Um, you know, my organization has been one of a handful of organizations that have served as a kind of um, um, outlet for those who have information that they want to disclose. So we get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of calls um, in a month, and uh, when we're able, when we have the resources, uh, when there's a, a systematic problem or one of great importance to the American public, um, then we'll use our resources to, to help um, get that information out and find some solutions to the problem. Uh, but we can't do it all. And uh, we certainly, uh, right now, are not doing it in the way in which uh, open leaks would provide or another venue. I mean, I would say that there are unlimited places uh, for people to blog, to use social media, but. You know, where is the place for them to go so that there's real attention paid? Um, the right people are watching and looking. Um, we've been pushing the government to do this in different areas. So the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we were urging them to put complaints online openly, uh, allow people to, to say if they're getting ripped off by this you know, credit card company or the fees are really high over here. And, uh, we're going to continue to urge them to do that, as, but we had to pass a law to get the Consumer Product Safety Commission to do the same, and that was tough. <laughs> that was really tough. 
And industries don't want you know, this information out there. But, so I would say it's not going to come from government first, <laughs> this solution. It's going to come uh, from innovators uh, outside. Just to add sort of one more point that, uh, that's responsive to the question as well. We, we just, uh, at some point, we just did a survey of uh, congressional websites for, for many different types of content. The one thing that we looked at was how many congressional community pages have a place where people can uh, engage in whistleblowing. And I think it was only four or five congressional community websites actually had a place probably featured or featured at all where you could go in and either get instructions or, 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 or uh, file a complaint to the, the committee. And there's, uh, I, I forget the, the exact number, but there's maybe 50 congressional committees, something like that. Um, maybe two-thirds of them are engaged in oversight. So there are a lot of people that will, could benefit from this information, but the most prominent way that people find out about what they're doing doesn't even have a means for people to, uh, to engage in this kind of reporting. Uh, so there, there are certainly things that can be done even within the narrow congressional context to encourage these kinds of communications. Uh, I, also, I also want to uh, highlight something that Mika said in, in, uh, in, his, in his book as sort of a, a kickoff to, to uh, a question I have for all of you. Uh, he wrote, and I apologize for quoting you back to yourself. Um, whistleblowing is a vital part of a healthy democracy and also the healthy global culture. For people in positions of power, the knowledge uh, that, that what they are doing might someday be leaked or otherwise exposed can shift behavior in a better direction. So the question that I have, or one of the questions that I have, is we are starting to see more and more information coming available in these kinds of ways. Whether it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago where you started seeing the newspapers playing this new kind of role with attending our papers too much more recently where, where blogs and anonymous comments and all these other kinds of things are changing um, the social dynamic of what's going on. That the emergence of, of um, mashing of data it helps reveal trends that would be hidden otherwise. Uh, by putting together different data sets, we can find out really interesting things about, oh, someone gave a donation two days before a vote, and the amendment that was going to be considered has been withdrawn, and happened to the people who gave the money uh, were also opponents of that amendment. I mean, you can start making these kinds of connections, and we're seeing this happen again and again and again and again. And as more information is made available in useful formats, uh, we're able to draw more of these connections. Um, but what I want to know is, since this is happening, is this changing the behavior of government? Is there is is the response to to clamp down that we've seen perhaps some prosecutions coming from the Obama administration? Uh, is it to is it to open up in different ways? Is it to uh, you know avoid engaging in, in otherwise um, um, uh, inappropriate behaviors? What you know what do you see on the ground? What's what's happening? I'm seeing not just one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly um, there is a nascent and growing open government culture that has grown out of the open government directive. And we're talking about people getting together and thinking about how to make their agencies more open, how to, what, in, what information is uh, considered high value. Here. You've got the right people in the room. You've got public affairs talking to the techies, talking to the policy people for the first time about these kinds of things, and thinking about government service in a different way. Uh, that's very positive, although you know it's just beginning. So um, there are some success stories, but you know, over time, this is going to take time to change culture, and especially culture that is resistant to change. <laughs> um, but. Then on the other hand, we have really a, a national security, um, uh, I don't know uh, what the word is, it's, it's, it's almost like its own government. It's almost like its own entity. Uh, the national security mindset, the national security community, um, the, the, the buzzword uh, and that you know, we've given people a pass for a really long time. Uh, Especially since 9/11, on just you know pulling the national security car uh, whenever they want to keep things secret, and you know to be honest, sometimes it's just easier to keep a secret because you know it's just easier to do things the way you've always done it. It's just 
less trouble, um, and uh, so it's not always for nefarious reasons. Um, but, but agencies are the ones, particularly with national security responsibilities, are actively seeking, um, you know, to uh, withhold more and more information, and those that have something embarrassing to hide also are similarly seeking more exemptions from the Freedom of Information Act, and uh, we're, I, you know, all the time dealing with those. So, I think it's a mixed bag. Eventually, there will be a tipping point. There will be a tipping point where there's just so much information out there, and we've got to get to the point where uh, it's easier for information to get out. Right now, you know, the process is so designed to uh, require a request for information. Uh, so we need to, for example, label records at birth so that they can just automatically be disclosed instead of, you know, being put into boxes and then, you know, requiring people to send in, please send me this. So we, we, have, this, we will get there, I'm sure. I think we're, we're edging towards it, but it's going to take some time and some work. I, when we talk about federal employees, I think that we use that synonymously with folks in the executive branch. Are there any ideas and thoughts on extending whistleblower protections to those in the legislative branch for those things that wouldn't be protected by the speech and debate clause of the Constitution? There's, there's a bill um, Senator Grassley regularly introduces that would provide for whistleblower protections for congressional staff. I don't think it's ever had a hearing. Right, there was also a recent, um, uh, a recent court decision that further narrowed um, employee protections uh, for congressional staff. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember all of the details, but it, but it was, and unfortunately, it further weakened the ability of folks to go to the internal reporting agency within Congress. Um, I don't, I, I, believe, I don't know if it was a statutory interpretation or a constitutional interpretation. I have to look at it more closely. Um, but there have, there has been action uh, uh, from a legal point of view on, on that kind of thing as well. Um, but we do see a continuing distinction between congressional employees uh, and those in the executive and, and uh, judicial branches in terms of the protections that are afforded them. Unfortunately, for congressional staff, it's, it's much, much less than in other contexts. So, so uh, can I just add one thing? There is the Congressional Accountability Act for not dealing with whistleblower or speech issues, but for things like employment discrimination, sexual harassment, sex discrimination. And the idea when Congress passed that act was to make themselves, make Congress uh, subject to the same laws that private sector employers are subject to. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't worked out quite as well as we all had hoped, but it is there and it is a mechanism. Thank you. With your areas of expertise, what can someone in the Mr. Sanchez's position be doing? And then as a follow-up, if you had a magic wand, what could Congress be doing when they saw someone with the sort of problems described by Mr. Sanchez? So, um, I think that, I don't know if you've taken your complaint to the Office of Special Counsel uh, yet, but, um, you know, in the past that's been um, not advisable. Uh, honestly, when we have um, had whistleblowers come to us, you know, the first thing we say is stay anonymous if you can, but know that you probably can't, and then think about what you're risking. Um, and now, um, I, I think that it's it's certainly the Office of Special Counsel will fulfill its role in receiving complaints and 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 doing investigations in a way that um, has been. Um, not happening for a really long time. Uh, so th there are, there's the Office of Special Counsel, there are, uh, there's the uh, Inspectors General seeking um, legal counsel, seeking help from organizations like the Government Accountability Project or coming uh, to make disclosures to a group like POCO. Um, also um, meeting with the members of Congress and, um, and making them aware of the problems. Uh, and then um, members of Congress, I think, some, some offices, some committees, even if they don't have on their websites um, hotlines for whistleblowers, some committees um, and some members of Congress in particular work 
um, very hard um, to with whistleblowers um, on their disclosures, um, and others not so much. Uh, so it depends on what your issue is, uh, whether you're going to have good luck with Congress. But Congress needs to fix the law. So Mr. Sanchez has better protection. So there was a second half of that question, which is the magic wand part, which is okay, with the law the way it is now, what needs to be done to, to change it so that it looks better to stand for supporters? And there's legislation that's pending for us, but, but you know, with the back court rulings and other things that's going on, what is necessary? You know, where, where do the changes need to be made? Uh, the, as I mentioned, um, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act um, does a fair job of addressing the major concerns with the current law, so uh, closing uh, loopholes that have been created by that, that case law, expanding protections, providing normal access to court, um, providing uh, Office of Special Counsel with additional authority and ability to uh, participate and be helpful uh, in those blur cases that go to the MSPB, um, and um, an ombudsman for inspectors general offices for whistleblowers, so there's someone dedicated to working with whistleblowers within each of those offices. If I may just add, I mean, you know, if, if my office is going to be effective, you know, if Congress wants to send their constituents to the Office of Special Counsel and be able to tell them that, you know, you're going to be able to get help from this office, I need resources. Um, you know, when you can't cut this agency's budget significantly and expect us to handle 4,000 complaints a year um, in, the, in the way in which they deserve to be um, treated, you know. And, and so I would just say that we're going to work really hard to try and get Congress aware that appropriations that are um, provided to this agency will be very well spent. What's the, what's the overall appropriation? What was the last year? For fiscal year 11, our appropriation was 18.5. Uh, Congress, uh, House of Representatives, in its current appropriations bill, has recommended um, 17.9, so it's a cut. Um, yeah, and our the recommended level um, that the White House asked for was 19.5, um, and we have requested 20 million which is still, you know, just a speck of dust on the federal budget. It's a tiny, tiny amount of money for the type of work that we do and the payback that I think the federal government can expect uh, if we're doing our job correctly in the way in which it needs to be done. We're also getting two to three hundred more cases a year um, under a USERA demonstration project, so a lot of our resources are going to have to go um, to helping veterans and members of the military and the reserves, um, which is obviously important. But in terms of really being um, a robust, effective agency, we need the resources to do that work. So uh, staying on that subject for a second, um, uh, and if I could wave a magic wand, uh, what I would say is I would love to see the Office of Special Counsel in the same way that you're using electronic media like these microphones and those C-SPAN cameras to uh, make a strong case um, for the vital work that you do. Um, I would love to see uh, the office also enter the digital age and um, embrace uh, both the ability to uh, have a two-way conversation with the public through social media uh, and also um, help educate the public about the value of what you do so that it becomes a little bit of a higher priority, say as much as uh, military bans uh, in terms of the funding uh, that you get. Um, those, are, those are definitely both priorities. You know, getting the Facebook page, uh, revamping our website so that it is more interactive and provides meaningful information uh, to the stakeholders of the office and all federal employees. So really high priorities. Doing education and outreach, very high priority. And you know, going out to the agencies. Doing programs like this one. You know, I'm here today. Uh, because I want to get the word out. And, but again, it takes resources, it takes people. And we have you know, competing interests in you know, how to balance trying to get complaints investigated and um, you know, robust representation and do our website and do outreach and you know, do all the other things that we need to do. So, but they're all priorities, I assure you. I totally agree, and I, I just want to say, <laughs> 
the idea that the work of government has to only be done by people who are paid by government is one of the changes, that, one of the culture changes that I'm arguing for, that we have to get rid of that idea. So um, you're right, certain things have to be done by the responsible people who are paid. But the fact is that I'm sure uh, that people who are watching this, uh, not just the people in this room, instinctively think that uh, supporting whistleblowers uh, through the Office of Special Counsel is a vital government function, and they would be willing to help. Um, so you are not uh, uh, stuck with only the resources that you get through the formal appropriation. There are these other public resources to tap. That's what social media enables. It isn't just a tool for better communicating out. It's also a way for taking in, and it can be, whether it's whistleblowing, uh, uh, you know, reports of, of problems that need to be investigated, or uh, other means of, of in involving the public. It's we the people, not we the government. Um, and so I, I just urge you, and, and I'm sure uh, the Sunlight Foundation, um, as part of its mission uh, to help keep opening up government, uh, would love to work with your office and other uh, offices in government on ways to tap into the civic surplus. Uh, the people, uh, the same people who post comments on blogs and make edits on Wikipedia pages out of the goodness of their hearts, I think would also be happy to donate time, ideas, attention uh, to making government work better. I'd like to thank our panelists, Carolyn Lundy, Angela Canterbury, Christian Sanchez, and Nico Sipri. For, for traveling, for, for enlightening us in this conversation. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you all for coming.